Hi, everybody. This is Tiffany from We Are Here, a literary space for Black boys and young Black men. And today we are here with one of the leading researchers um, for young Black males, Dr. Alfred Canem. Thank you so much for being here with, with me today to discuss your new book, Teaching Black Boys in Elementary Grades, Advanced Disciplinary Readings and Writings to Secure Their Futures. Thank you so much for being here. All right. Thanks for the invitation. Not a problem. So usually we um, we like to talk about it's kind of like a a, a, liter, a um, like a literacy biography, if you will, is what we primarily do. So I wanted to know learn more about you and um, thinking about you focus on elementary grades. And so if we look back on you and your childhood, what was it like for you um, in regards to literacy in elementary school? You know, I. Uh... You know, I was very fortunate, had a great experience, but I wasn't necessarily uh, driven by what was happening in the classroom. I, I had a, my best friend and I would uh, battle who could read the most books. Uh, at that time, the Chicago Public uh, Library had the summer book competitions, and we were always angling who could have uh, uh, who could read the, 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 the most text. And so uh, I found some inspiration from one of my uh, peers. Uh, we weren't reading the same things, but we were always trying to uh, pivot. Uh, if you think about, uh, we were competitive at, at, every, every, at everything. And usually you don't hear about uh, young boys being competitive in a reading space. Yeah. Uh, and we were equally competitive on the basketball court, who has the best jump shot. But it was that reading thing that really uh, cemented and defined our friendship. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite book in elementary school? Do you remember? Yeah, I was a, a Encyclopedia Brown fanatic. <laughs> um, but uh, I'd love to share this. It was uh, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret by Judy Bloom. I love Judy Bloom books. Uh, I'm shocked. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and um, my reading really shifted as I became older. But I remember I would cozy up and read about the lives of these young girls, Blubber, and, you know, um, and, and Judy Bloom even changed the way I prayed. So I would say, Are you there? God is me. Uh, <laughs> very influential. And so, um, but, but I, I had so many uh, texts that uh, resonated with me, but uh, that's where it really started for me. How did you become such a diverse reader so young? You know, most people have stick to a, a genre, you know, like, and, and things like that. How, how did that, ha how do you think that that happened? Uh, revolving bookshelves. Okay. And so uh, a lot of this can be attributed to librarians. They found a way to position different types of text. And so you'd have, these are the new books that are coming out, uh, or they would have them prominently placed uh, in, in, the, in the library. And I just started you know, taking a look at what's there. And that's how I really discovered Dick Gregory when my uh, reading uh, sort of became more informed by my cultural identity. Mm -hmm. It was that revolving uh, bookshelf. Okay. And I had a personal relationship with my librarian, too. Uh, I used to, they, they would give us a limit of how many books you could take out, three or four books. I don't remember the number. And I said, no, this is not enough. Uh, can you expand my limit? And uh, she started expanding the limit. And that was really designed so kids would not accumulate fines at that time. No one wanted to pay that extra nickel or dime. Mm -hmm. And so she was trying to safeguard my pockets but it did work for me uh, from a, a, a literacy standpoint. So I used to live in Chicago. Were you at the downtown branch primarily? Are you Brownsville? Which one were you? What was your primary? Uh, the Martin Luther King Branch Library on 35th and yeah. King Drive. Okay, mm -hmm. there you go. And so you so you had a personal relationship or your librarian knew you and, and things like that. Oh, yeah. a huge difference, a huge difference. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Did you and have she would library? even... Uh, we, we did, but school, school library, and, and we will take some books out there, but the school library was more about uh, uh, how do you catalog and understand the Dewey Decimal System at, at, at the time. 
Um, it's more about skill development, but um, it wasn't the school library that uh, uh, was a significant part of my upbringing. Okay. Who is your reading role model? Who would you say and why? I had an uncle. Um, this was before Google and you know, the internet. And every time the family had a question or there was an argument, uh, they would call, his, his name was Uncle Willie. Uh, they would call Uncle Willie and he was like this walking encyclopedia. It's like, man, how do you know all of this uh, uh, stuff? And so there was just an assumption. And we, we never verified if he was correct, but he solved a lot of family arguments. But the idea that you could call on someone who was well-read uh, just resonated uh, uh, with me. And uh, he was generous with his time. You know, all family arguments don't take place between nine and five. Sometimes they take place at 2 a.m. And they would just call Uncle Willie and uh, ask these tough questions and make these nickel bets. And, and, and so that, that, uh, uh, that, that, that's sort of family lore. And I really love that. Um, so um, you were talking about your public library and how did she nurture that? How did they nurture that relationship with you to get you more involved? You know, it's it's um, when you give when you recognize people and you give them personal attention and you know their names, uh, that 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 means a lot. And so, uh, when you keep showing up and they start asking you questions and start asking you about what you want to read or make these recommendations, uh, I really uh, really appreciated that. Sorely, I don't remember uh, the librarian's name but I know she knew my name when I came uh, to the uh, library and I appreciate it uh, that. Personal, personal contact and personal relationships. Wholeheartedly. So then you go on and um, were you um, equally as motivated, probably more so in, in high school with you know, reading and it's just, you just were one of those kids that fell into the category that was just a great reader, you know? Just drilling skills yeah. at home and things like that. Yeah, what, what I didn't share is um, um, I started reading five pounds of books a month when I was 11. Yeah. Um, so don't know where that idea or notion uh, came from, but it was, uh, I guess, a way to uh, meter uh, my own reading and uh, set a, a goal. Um, so one of my goals was try to become taller. And so, you know, you draw that little line on your door, mm -hmm. but also I had that reading goal connected to, uh, the, the, the weight of, 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 of the text. And so, which is a practice I still use today. I still have a scale in my home, uh, yeah. that keeps me moving uh, forward. Um, but, but in high school, I was very fortunate to, uh, have good um, uh, English teachers. And, and so I would read uh, mostly uh, the fictional text that they provided, but I had to find a way to complement that with uh, more, more informational text on the uh, outside. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that, that's sort of where it was. And, and every year uh, I would always buy the uh, almanac um, because it would give you uh, these major facts and in some ways that guided what I should become, uh, what I should be uh, becoming smarter about. And so uh, there were some strange things that, that led to my uh, uh, mosaic literacy uh, life. Mm. Uh, and same, same thing uh, in, in college. And, um, you, know, you know, sometimes you party into the wee hours of the morning, but, you know, my, and I was in a fraternity, why I'm in the fraternity, and they're like, "Hey, you got the parties?" Uh, not all the time, uh, but there were some times uh, uh, that I would. Uh, my roommate would catch me doing that. It, it was way away. Uh, some people like chocolate milk, uh, uh, ch uh, chocolate cookies, and warm milk to put them to sleep. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I like a good paragraph. Mm -hmm. You were the brother that held up the grade point for, for. The <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> As awesome. Didn't have the chapter suspended. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you do? Um, so what were your decision making that led you to education and you know to become a teacher and things like that? 
Yeah, I don't know if I wrote this in the book, but I was a finance major. Uh, I, I equally love mathematics, and I that that was my favorite uh, subject, as a matter of fact. Uh, but in my junior year in college, I read a newspaper article uh, that chronicled the reading underperformance of black boys. Um, and it was on that day that I discovered the College of Education. Uh, I did not know a College of Education existed. Uh, and I just entered into a, a, a different a world uh, at that time because of that uh, newspaper article. Uh, I was uh, on a bus uh, to uh, a class uh, during a winter morning. And as I'm reading this paper, um, and I discovered that on that day, and, and, I, and at the time, I had no idea that uh, I wouldn't uh, find other men in these courses, which was uh, quite frightening. Mm -hmm. Finance, a lot of men in classes. I go over to college education. I'm like, whoa, why am I the only one here? You know, so it was that yeah. type of awakening for me. So you get your degree in education and you go into the classroom. What did you find yeah. um, were some of your your successes, your best successes, and then what were some of your setbacks? What were some of the harder things that you had to contend with as an educator, so especially those first few years? <laughs> you know, it, it was a, a blessing and a curse that um, we didn't have an established curriculum. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I read widely, I, I was both a language arts and a social studies teacher. So it was really the social studies that informed how I thought about my work and, uh, uh, but I had the autonomy to select a wide range of texts because there was an absence of those, um, uh, the things that I wanted students to be reading uh, in the classroom. So that, that was the blessing uh, piece. It was also uh, quite pleasing to me that uh, when, you, when I started sharing a wide range of texts with students, they uh, became excited about this. But I had a lot of students who had never finished a text in their life. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, God, you, you, know, I, you know, I wasn't, you know, totally naive that this was taking place, uh, but it was not their fault. I mean, just not an expectation that, you know, you actually, you know, read stuff in, in, in serious uh, ways. And so that absence of a curriculum and... Uh, it, it, it forced me to start thinking strategically about ways I can insert literature, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, essays, newspaper articles uh, into my uh, curriculum. So I have to jump back a little bit too on this because you talk about writing a lot through your books and you, I, I assume that you've always been a writer as well. Yes. So that, and, and writing is one of, I think, the most neglected things, especially when I, I went yeah. through my teaching program, I didn't get a lot of writing yeah. instruction, right? You know, so you, you, you go in, you know, like, so what was it like for you navigating that when you're like, especially when you're, you know, like a proficient writer and then you're dealing with kids and you're just like, what is going on, you know? Um. <clears throat> You know, I, I started teaching in the 90s, and um, I remember one of my first poster boards, I played on uh, Spike Lee's film, Do the Right Thing, R-I-T-H-T. I put <laughs> Do the Right Thing, R-W-R-I-T-E. Um, you know, it, it was really exciting um, creating that culture because, you know, from an oral tradition, you know, students just had these powerful narratives and powerful stories. And I said, you know, you're being selfish with this stuff. You know, you have to start sharing with others what you know, uh, giving your perspective, but you can't let your writing get in the way. And so early on, we became a committee to destroy raggedy writing. You, know? <laughs> you put that in the book too. I was like, he put yeah, yeah. in the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and so once you create that culture of care, uh, it just goes a, a long way. And I did one thing. I moved out every desk and I came in and I laid the floor down. With, and this was seventh and eighth grade. Moved every desk to the um, edges of the room and just put paper all over the room uh, on the floor. 
And uh, we just started scribbling and scribbling and scribbling. Uh, but I also discovered writing can be dangerous. Mm. <laughs> um, there were two young students who did not like each other. And it was a poetry unit. And um, so they would write a poem. You know how rappers have battles? Yeah. They would write a poem. And I'm like, oh, this is gorgeous. And then I hear students clapping for one student. And then this other a girl would write a poem. But they were talking about one another. I'm out of the loop on this. And it intensified to the point where they both stood up. But they were using writing. And I said, you know, if you can use writing for evil, uh, <laughs> you can use writing for good. But to take that powerful tool uh, in the presence of a teacher, and I, I, I was uh, victimized in this case, and, uh, but it was something about a passion that drives others when they want to get their point across to communicate, and then just putting those working tools um, uh, so that your own writing does not get in the way of your message. And I love that. But when I started working with uh, young boys in Chicago, uh, there were so many other people describing uh, who these young men are. And I said, you have a responsibility to describe yourself because if you don't do that, others might get it wrong. And so that elevated writing as a tool of uh, cultural uh, protection, cultural preservation, uh, cultural self-determination uh, uh, moving forward. And so that's when I, I said that we, our writing must be imbued with significance and we have to uh, nurture the next generation of writers. That was book number uh, three, it was called Fearless Voices, but that was the genesis of it. You have to describe who you are um, so that others uh, can't, sort of shape your identity without your permission you know like i imagine you know people read your book and and from the majority culture as well but i think a piece of it too is that how your relationship with these kids right like how did what was your thought or what what advice would you give in terms of the relational aspect of this um especially with black boys yeah, uh, it's 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 a, it's a relationship is is, is, a, is a, a a tricky thing. I, I think if the relationships are substantive, um, and even rocked with some tensions at some time, um, it should communicate that uh, I am on your side. And in that communication, it may cause students to like or dislike you. Uh, I remember one of my eighth grade students said, man, I used to hate you. You took everything was all serious and you were on us. So you wouldn't characterize that as a great relationship when someone says, I hate you. But when he graduated, we had eighth grade graduation in Chicago. You know that. Uh, he took the time to write that, man, it was through that hate that I found myself. He had resentment with his own father, and he shared this. And I, I really appreciated uh, where he was coming from. But while I was trying to build a relationship, I wasn't trying to be a friend. I was trying to be someone who had some level of um, uh, academic authority that would support students, uh, allow them to interpret the way they need to interpret. Uh, so that went a long way. Um, but I also see their soft relationships. I love you. Uh, but I can love you to a point where I allow you to fail in my presence. And, and that's not a very good relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing for me, I'd never bastardized the relationship. I never assumed I knew who these boys were, uh, their home lives, even though I, I taught in the same community where I was raised, uh, very cautious about, about bastardizing uh, certain uh, identities and assuming that because I had similar experiences that that would strengthen my relationship. It gave me an understanding, uh, but they are still traveling through their own experiences, traveling through their own time. And although I was a very young teacher, they could see me as a distance. I'm now part of this, you know, teaching middle class, although I was only making $27,000 at the time, but that was more than my students were making. But, you know, they had no idea, you know, how much a teacher makes. 
So you can see a difference there. And so you always have to mediate those relationships in very responsible ways. So then if we think about like um, the funds and knowledge aspect of it and bring around, yeah. there's the parent role as well, right? And you, you so how do you um, engage the parents, especially I think with literacy now, there's this whole movement of rethinking literacy and all this stuff like that. But yeah. how do we get this information to the parents so that support is there so that they know like, you know, the library can be used for this and, you know, like take this for practice and all these other kind of things. You know, I, I, I find that, um, you know, um, just recognizing the, so the powerful role parents can play and sometimes you become overwhelming with parents. I, I find quick, small tips go a long way. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you ask a question? How do you encourage students to, your children to read? Sometimes that's just putting a one pager on their pillow at night. I call these pillow pages. That's something practical that a parent can do. I just got a tweet from my niece, you know, young, young kid, and she was asking me about workbooks. And she said, he, my, my son's in fourth grade. He's very smart. Should I give him a third grade or fourth grade workbook? I said, no, give him a fifth and sixth grade workbook. Uh -huh. And I said that because third grade workbook may, uh, fourth, may keep him busy. A fifth grade and sixth grade workbook may lead him to generate more questions, which is a good thing. Now, that was a tip that says, oh, I never even thought it about, about it from that perspective, that I could give him because there's no harm if you have a fifth grade workbook. Either you can do it or not. But it was a manageable tip. And it was like revelatory that I could actually get a workbook a year above uh, my. Uh, uh, so, I, and I think about very practical ways to do those things. Word snacks. Sometimes parents uh, can increase their vocabulary simply by giving their kids a word snack. Um, this was bad parenting on my part. I don't know if I read about that in this book, but my son, when he was younger, came home from school, dad, I need a snack. I was working. I said, what snack on this? And I just gave him a word. <laughs> I don't think that's what, what he was asking me, uh, but I started doing that in kindergarten classrooms as a reading specialist. Here's your own personal word snack. So parents can do those practical things that signifies um, the uh, importance of reading while helping, you know, nurture their own kids' uh, personal and intellectual development. Short, practical, manageable. So you have your new book out and it's, it's, it's really interesting too, because it's coming at a time when like science reading and yeah. COVID and we're, we're just in this place of like, things need to change. Yeah. You know, and we can or cannot do things. So um, what I like too is that this kind of addresses like, you know, you, you can go through uh, the initial aspects of, of literacy, but there's this part, and I know I was a third grade teacher and you start to see it in third grade, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's that mm -hmm. fourth through even seventh and eighth grade where it's like, this is where it, uh, this is the make or break part. Um, so I like that this book, book really focuses on that, that, that upper elementary part, because this is where you start to see the, the, um, the change in things. But what I was curious about is that kind of before this, when you're in the earlier elementary part, it's to me like you're, you're going to go through the, the beginning uh, literacy things, you know, like learning sounds and things like that. But what, how does identity play a part? in this early aspect of schooling and literacy, you know, like building cultural identity? Um, it, it, it varies widely. So when I started looking at, when I started paying, you know, concentrated attention to identities, I was trying to figure out um, which identities are most important to, uh, grant students access into the literacy arena. Uh, cultural identity is is, is, is is critical, but there are other forms of identity that can be leveraged. Developmental identity, mm -hmm. um, gender identity. You know, when I started reading Encyclopedia Brown, it was really about, you know, here's this boy detective 
he has a garage doing certain stuff. And, and so I was really connected to his uh, gender identity. Uh, but then you have um, uh, community and identity. Uh, I read Were You There, God Is Me, Margaret, because it was more about developmental identity. I'm not a young white, I wasn't a young white girl at the time, but I could, you know, I, I was traveling through school and saw some of the same things that they were uh, experiencing. Um, and, and then cultural identity is, 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 is another identity that you could um, uh, leverage in powerful ways and nurture, not just leverage and nurture. Mm. Um, but one of the things that we cannot predict is which identity is most salient for a student at a particular time. Mm -hmm. So even when I choose a book with black male characters or black protagonist, uh, I'm not always certain that's the thing they're going to pay attention to, uh, but the text selection gives them that affordance. Mm -hmm. And so I think about identity and which affordances they actually uh, uh, provide. Uh, but then there are other times I'm going to specifically drive home uh, the need uh, to learn about uh, a cultural identity, if that's part of the overall intellectual development of a piece. Mm -hmm. But a black male character alone won't do it. You didn't ask me that question. Um, mm -hmm. um, what we want to do is we don't want to miss the mark. I'll, I'll, if I have time, I'll give you a short, a very short story. Mm -hmm. I, I told you I was a social studies teacher. And uh, I remember this young girl uh, in my class said, Dr. Tatum, I mean, Mr. Tatum, you always have us reading this black stuff. It's like overwhelming. And uh, she transferred out. Uh, I think her family went to uh, a Michigan at the time and she was the only uh, black girl in the class. I get a letter from her mother, uh, no, my call at the time, call from her mother and says, Mr. Tatum, can you recommend black text? Because my daughter wants to read more of it. So in that environment, it was like, wow. Mm. But she felt the absence outside of that environment. Uh, but she knew that uh, she had that experience. But I appreciated that because she was saying, see me in my entire, uh, 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 see me for my full uh, breadth uh, and depth. And that's why we don't want to miss the mark or bastardize identities. And that's just one example. What about the argument though that you know what's lacking is that they don't see themselves and they don't you know what i mean this is why they're not engaged in and this type of thing so where do you you know what i mean this is what so so people are going hard on the relevant cultural relevance and sustainability yeah. you, know, you know what i mean mm -hmm. so and in essence is i guess it's kind of like you know mm -hmm. you have to put a little put a little bit of everything in there but it seems too mm -hmm. that like a lot of the discipline issues and things like that happen. So is it that it's not the kids and it's the teacher per se, or you know what I mean? Or where's where's a, a lot of, you know, like the misconstruing of how to approach this because, right? So if, 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 if the messaging is that they need to have a sense of identity to be successful mm -hmm. in school, you know, like people are going hard on cultural sustainability, but it's really, you know, you have to have the interdisciplinary approach is what you're saying as well. Yeah, identity is really important. I mean, I, I think, you know, I mean, you know, um, if, if you think about it, I started talking about my identity, my family identity and what, what influenced my reading, my, my community identity with in the black community with this librarian who uh, so all, all of that, that that's uh, um, uh, important. And, and, I, and I had some real experiences that uh, uh, I think could have been unique to being a young Black boy growing up on the south side of Chicago. So when I read Richard Wright's Black Boy and uh, Native Son, I mean, uh, and Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, I mean, those were powerful texts. Autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, all of those were very powerful uh, texts to me. And um, um, but and I probably could have been absolutely fine traveling through life, just having read those texts alone. Um, but I also think about if we don't interrogate the question that you're asking, it can foreclose exposures to other uh, texts. And so physics, for example, can be the identity of young boys too. Or, or young girls, mm -hmm. um, biology, 
uh, chemistry. And so when we think about how we are nurturing identities, what does that really mean? And what are we appropriating for, as certain identities for some and not others? Uh, reading about the universe is an identity. Theology is an identity. You know, and oftentimes if you know, we're talking about young uh, students, uh, let's say they have a strong church going culture in their home, but they're not, uh, they're never reading uh, theology, then we sort of narrowed uh, what it means to pay attention uh, to the, their, their identities. Gotcha. Because, you know, as a, as a people, uh, we have to uh, find a way to uh, protect ourselves across all academic disciplines. So it's equally important that those uh, become part of our uh, identity. I'm reading about, uh, currently I'm reading about uh, uh, Black environmentalists and our relationship between literacy and land uh, with, with Black people. Uh, sometimes nature is not part of our identity uh, or the land, um, but it can have an adverse impact on our life expectancy rate if we're not paying attention to what's happening in nature, the environment, et cetera. And so how do we reconcile becoming smart about all of the disciplines while also nurturing our cultural identity and then expanding what that means across the generations? Mm -hmm. So do you think, and I know one of the, the points of your book is um, when you talk about building relationships with disciplines, like when a teacher reads this book and you know, really, um, when you talk about um, thinking across text, do you think that that's something like we're taught, we're kind of forced to think in isolation. We're doing ELA here. Yeah. We have this black. We mm -hmm. have this black. It, teaching transferability is not common in yeah. schools. You know. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, sometimes when I'm, you know, modeling a particular lesson, I would ask uh, the question, uh, am I teaching um, reading right now or am I teaching uh, history right now? Mm -hmm. You know, we have to sort of uh, blur the lines between what that means. Uh, both of, whether it's reading or history, both of them rely on the same 26 letters of the alphabet. It's the content, uh, the knowledge that becomes different. So whether I'm having you monitor your comprehension as a reading to, to nurture you as a reader, or whether I'm having you merge, monitor your comprehension so you can better understand uh, historical text, there's really no, comprehension monitoring doesn't care where you situate it. We make decisions how we want to situate. Uh, word study doesn't care where you situate. It doesn't say situate me outside of the disciplines. Um, phonics doesn't care how you situate it. Right. I mean, the, these are uh, correlates of reading achievement that we sort of imprison by smallness. They don't care how they manifest, but we make those uh, decisions. That's why text is a critical piece here. Uh, I, I say you have to have quality teaching. This is you have to know how to teach reading, but you know think about text more broadly. It 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 makes a significant difference. Yeah, the <clears throat> within the within your multidimensional um, reading model, um, I actually I you know I always go in as like the 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 elementary teacher, and it's just shocking at first because it's like this is so structured and it's. It's a, it's chunking, which I like, especially for where kids are nowadays with, I need quick pieces of something, but it was so dense with important things. Like you could pick up so much from these pieces and you know, a teacher's going to read this and they're going to be like, but how do I get texts like that? You know what I mean? Like, how do I do that? What's your answer to that? Five pounds of books per month. <laughs> Put a lot of money on Amazon. Librarians. No, you say librarians because that's who they should be reaching out to to help them to, to get this yeah. stuff. Right? Yeah. 
<laughs> I, I was going to add librarians in there too. Uh, uh, I, I spoke in New York once. It was to all librarians. And I said, if I ever had to be, have an army, I would have want to be among an army of librarians. Um, but, but the other part is um, we have so many tools available to us now. Uh, even the team that I worked with, we use Flipboard a lot. That's the app on the phone. Mm-hmm. And you can really, um, and you can cut and paste a lot of stuff from the uh, Flipboard app. But we have a text repository right in our pockets in, in most cases. Okay. And you can get up-to-date information. You can get historical information. Um, so if you go to Flipboard right now and put, you know, environmentalist, urban environmentalist or urban agriculture, something's going to come up that's modern. Uh, I mean, that, that that's current uh, that you could use. And we have to make the decision of how we uh, make some adjustments in terms of um, uh, length uh, because of the instructional time that we have if we want to get them to the multi-dimensional reading model. Mm-hmm. So a wide range of resources, uh, it's available. You know, now we, we really don't have uh, any reasons not to be able to do this. Mm-hmm. Cause when you, I, I heard you speaking about, um, speaking about this model in, in another, uh, another workshop and it was about, um, you know, you're, it was the hand sanitizer case. And I was like, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. But when mm-hmm. I actually saw and you had like, the gross pictures of the sneeze and then mm-hmm. the germs. I'm like, yes, because that mm-hmm. as a kid would get me. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Right. That's the stuff I was like, yes. So I see how it's all being kind of like pulled together. And I was like, when when we talk about responsive, it's not just the cultural, it's what's the yeah. things that grab people. And when you were talking about the one part in the boot book about, yeah, you got to talk about poop and boogers and all this kind of stuff like that. I'm like, yes, because this mm-hmm. is what kids, this is what brings mm-hmm. kids in, this science. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? It's science. So that's when I was like, this, okay, I get how, you know, like how this works, but yet you can still have the intellectualism by bringing mm-hmm. in the, you know, the academic science piece mm-hmm. of it and, and all that kind of things too. So I appreciate it. That one side, when you see actually how it's laid out in these modules, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, when you're suggest, when teachers read this or educators read this, are you suggesting that they follow this model verbatim or is this something like this is your ideal and then you just kind of have to understand that these are the concepts that work? Yeah, it's really the dimensions that are most important. <clears throat> um, and, and the reason the, the multidimensional, it's uh, the key is to make sure whether you are a struggling reader or a non-struggling reader or advanced, whatever that means by third and fourth grade, uh, you will not be underserved by this particular uh, lesson. And so there are parts of it where, yes, uh, and and it um, um, begs for uh, thinking about pacing um, differently. You, you don't slow someone down who could move beyond this because you have to get through, you know, dimension number one. So having a clear, organized, structured way to think about literacy that pays attention uh, to those multi-dimensions is really the cornerstone uh, of, of, the, of the text. Uh, and what you'll find, particularly as you get to writing, what I found is you will have to use your expertise as a teacher to reflect, to think about um, what that next lesson looks like that supports students along uh, along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and the other important thing is make sure that it, it's, um, we got to pay attention to, to, to the uh, disciplinary, uh, dis- disciplinary equity. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, say very cl- clearly, we find that a lot of students experience disciplinary erasure uh, in the elementary grades. And so how do we combat that? Um, and that can lead to cultural erasure a uh, long term across institutions. So that, that's really the key point. Okay. Um, where does like a uh, deep discussion fit into this? Because it seems kind of process, like where do kids have that interaction where they can get the pros and cons and help 
synthesize and maybe flesh out ideas if the text is supposed to you know you you want to have like a more challenging text you know what I mean how do you see that playing a part of it uh, it should be threaded throughout uh, mm -hmm. so in a collaborative environment um, uh, students had a chance to talk about um, I think I gave the example of genetic engineering mm -hmm. so although they were giving focus on the individual aspects of reading word study fluency comprehension monitoring that did not stop these young boys from talking about um, I don't think we should have genetically engineered babies uh, and then when they had a chance to write about that that's when you could uh, have students start sharing their writings how they're taking this stuff up uh, in one of the last chapters for example uh, two boys said uh, they said Dr. Tatum can we write you know can we write our piece together and initially I said no I said, wait a minute, let me see how they try to write a piece together. Mm -hmm. And they started debating, this was important, this was important, this was important. And they decided that it's more difficult to write together than write individually. Mm -hmm. They thought they were going to uh, write together, finish and play with their Pokemon cards. <laughs> but they started getting into, into this intellectual debate and like, nah, man, you, you write yours, I write mine. But because they put something in writing, it allows students to enter the conversation and hear how others are thinking about it. So discussion is important. Um, I wanted to understand, and this is kind of moving away from that and going into you as, as your positionality, kind of like as a, a, a black professor mm -hmm. in education, mm -hmm. black, why are you having like difficulty getting people to see this research that you're doing? Like, and it's not just you, it's like, you know, like, but why, what does, you know, if they want answers, right? These districts are like, how can I help this, you know, these young black men or, you know, this my mi this minoritized community? Why do you think um, it's so hard to take in this type of advice and research that you have? Um, in, in a lot of cases, it can depend on the uh, context. Mm -hmm. So there can be a greater uptake you know, if you have 99% of your students are African American. Mm -hmm. Other districts are trying to figure out uh, what does this mean in an environment? So they'll say, well, will this work with girls? Will this work with white students? Will it work with Asian students? Uh, no, nothing I put in there is uh, focus on black boys only, but I did that intentionally. Mm -hmm. um, because when I first entered the work, folks were saying, um, they would take the reading research and say, well, uh, well, will this work with black boys? Mm. And I said, there's no such thing as a black male reading strategy or a white male reading strategy or you know, Asian reading strategy. And so I started in a different place. I started with black boys. So you no longer have to ask the question, will it work with black boys? Now, ironically, people are saying, well, will this work with other students? Yeah. Which is, um, and, and so we become locked behind we can become locked behind you know, categories that simply don't uh, make sense at, at the end of the day. Um, so it's, it's a wide range of reasons, but, but for, 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 for some of the work that I'm talking about specifically, it's we've become conditioned around mediocrity because of reading data. And so when you come in and say moving boys to advanced levels and they're struggling, like that's a, that's a conceptual shift because a nation just focuses on proficiency. Uh, in school, just we focus on meeting norms, you know, and, and so why are we even talking about going beyond what we're being held accountable to? Mm. And that, 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 that has been the most difficult uh, shift. And, and lastly, uh, working with some of my colleagues, the question always becomes, give me, a, um, give me the research. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't have a robust body of research on black boys. Uh, last chapter I wrote, on average, 2.2 research articles are written uh, per year, uh, specifically focused on black boys and reading and writing and language development. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so the default has been continue to use research that has not yielded uh, results for our children across any state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, there, there are reasons why people do X, Y, and Z, but. Uh, do, do you think you, in terms of being an academic that, and not just you specifically, but other yeah. researchers like um, Professor Brian and things like that, do y'all yeah. think y'all are too isolated in, in in academics? Like, I know you do community research, you know, like you work with community and teachers like that, but do maybe that culturally is not the way that we need to get this to, you know, get this from the research, you know, to the practice? Do we need to think about this differently for us? You know, like when I think about Goldie Mohammed's work and she was like, you know, we worked as a community and we taught this person and they took it there and did this do we need to reframe this you know yeah we, we we have to we have to think about our audiences uh very differently so anytime we scribble something you know we have a particular audience in mind but if we're going to mobilize a nation or mobilize a community uh you always have to be in contact um having these types of conversations uh working with parents directly um i i, I always say when I was uh, uh, to, to this uh, doctoral students I'm teaching is if, if we want uh, our research to matter, we have to put our body in front of the work. So that means we have to be present. Um, otherwise, we're just hoping that someone discovers it. Yeah. You know, don't make it difficult for people to find you. Mm -hmm. What does it take for us to get a literacy agenda? Do you know what I mean? Like, why is this this is so fundamental and yet and I, it's, it's answering the question but it's the hardest thing to get like recognized what do we need to do uh that that that's uh we know why we need to do it uh, in many cases we know how or what needs to be done but because you know, all of our communities are imbued with so much complexity, um, I, I think that becomes part of our challenge. And so when I talk to religious leaders, they may say, uh, uh, how do we mentor these young boys? Mm -hmm. When I talk to counselors, they may say, how do we do X, Y, and Z? And if you talk to... Um, uh, people across different disciplines, they, they have different pathways to get there, but it's not always embraced that this coheres around reading and writing. Um, or we need more uh, you know, programs to actively engage young boys. All of those things are absolutely necessary. But because we have boys across the economic spectrum and the academic spectrum, the needs vary. Uh, there was no ambiguity when uh, following emancipation. Reading and writing was a thing because it was denied for so long. We're now wrestling with the complexity and the ambiguity uh, because now we're talking about boys uh, and girls across the academic and the economic continuum and the needs are not the same. And, and that's why I attempted to say that, particularly around literacy, you have to pay attention to boys across the academic spectrum and the economic uh, spectrum because many of them are being underserved. But hearing that, um, it's not always uh, easy. You know, my, my kid is fine. You know, why are we talking about reading and writing? Well, they can be finer. Yep wholeheartedly. So lastly, I wanted to ask you a question. If you could give advice to young Black males regarding literacy, what would it be? Um, reading and writing are tools of protection. You know, don't uh, do anything to get in your own way. And lastly, you know, all texts belong to all Black boys and, and don't, you know, allow anyone to tell you differently. Uh, um, and um, 
here's one I, I told my students and my, 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 my sons. I said, you always have uh, to love yourself more than others. Don't assume someone else is going to love you more than you can love yourself. Mm. And uh, you always have to keep that in mind. I'm a chess player. So if I made a comparison, you always want all your pieces on the chessboard. You may not have to use them all, but if they're all there, it increases the likelihood for self-empowerment, self-determination, self-concept, identity development. I'm not going to play a game of chess or start off without having all of my pieces on the chessboard. And it's my responsibility to make sure that I'm protecting those pieces and use them as I need to, to protect me, to protect my family, to protect, uh, protect my posterity. Uh, and that's how we're gonna nurture the next generation um, and address some of these most intractable challenges that we have, but also open up the floodgates of possibilities. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to me today about this. I've learned so much out, even outside the book about you and I really appreciate this. Um, and hopefully, you know, like the viewers and hopefully some young man will see this and be like, I could do that too. All right, so thank you so much for your time. All right, I loved it. Appreciate the conversation. All right, you take care. Bye now. All right, bye-bye.